Good morning and welcome. I'm Amy Lair. I'm the director of the Human Rights Initiative at CSIS and really want to welcome you all here for the launch of the Global Peace Index. Um, I'm delighted to introduce the new executive director for the Americas for IEP, Michael Collins. He just joined and he brings about 15 years of senior management experience um, in international development and, and conflict areas and apparently originally started out as an engineer who had his own construction company. So a man of many talents. Um, Michael, I will let you take it from here. All right, excellent. Hello everybody, uh, thank you for coming and welcome. Um, thank you to the Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, for hosting this event and especially Amy Lair and her team who've helped put it all together. Uh, thank you also to our panelists, Stephen, Shannon, um, Jonathan, uh, for contributing your valuable time. Um, as I'm new to IEP, uh, and this will be my first event, uh, I wanted to take the opportunity to give my take on IEP's work while I'm still a relative outsider looking in. Uh, prior to joining IEP, I directed post-disaster reconstruction, disaster prevention, education, and employment programs in slums. Slum-dwelling families are often misrepresented in the census, their houses don't figure on any cadastral map, and since they rarely use formal services like banks or police, and they largely don't pay tax, there's very little information available on that segment of the population at all. This makes it significantly harder to develop appropriate policy, develop effective services, and help build community. Many local governments and organizations strive to improve data collection and analysis, but it's hard and expensive and often requires multiple levels of internal capacity building. Due to this, programs and policies are often put in place based on partial information uh, and often prove ineffective. Of course, access to data and the insight that comes from it is only the beginning of a much longer uh, and larger process, but it's nonetheless a key starting point. Coming from an environment where data was largely unavailable, it's also one of the things that most attracted me to working with IEP. IEP is dedicated to the careful and comprehensive selection and analysis of economic peace and prosperity indicators for practical use by policymakers, communities, development agencies, and peace building organizations around the world. Our indices, reports, and positive peace framework aim to not only better define and measure peace, but power, empower, can you guys hear me okay? I'm sorry. Um, but empower everyone to plan and undertake well-informed actions that will foster peacefulness and increase prosperity. We're very proud that the reports and indices we produce are frequently consulted, including among many others, the Positive Peace Report and the Global Terrorism Index, and grateful for the increasing opportunities we have to partner with governments, multilaterals, and nonprofit organizations to develop more localized and theme-based insights related to both negative and positive peace. Above all, we're grateful for the opportunity to be with you today as we discuss our latest, latest research and share updated results from our flagship report, the Global Peace Index. Thank you, Amy. I'll hand it back to you. Thanks so much, Michael. Michael's colleague, Lori Smolensky, will actually be going through the, the key results from the Global Peace Index. Lori's the Outreach and Development Officer at IEP, an expert on conflict resolution and, and international relations, and previously worked at the New York Immigration Coalition on immigration issues. Uh, Lori, please. Thank you, Amy. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Great. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. A huge thanks to Amy and Mary Faye for organizing. Thanks to CSIS for hosting us. And a thanks to the panelists for joining us this morning, as well as all of you for being here. So as Michael indicated, we're the Institute for Economics and Peace. We're a think tank that develops new metrics to understand peace in order to hopefully make it more achievable. Our headquarters are in Sydney, Australia, and we have five regional offices. So today we're very pleased to be sharing the findings of the 13th Global Peace Index, or GPI. I'm gonna explain some methodology and top line findings and trends. I'm not gonna to get too deeply into country, country scores and wonky indicators, but I wanna, I wanna emphasize that everything that I'll touch on is in the report if you'd like some more information. 
And I'm also going to touch on something called positive peace, which I think is a broader, more ambitious, more policy-oriented approach to peace with social and political dimensions that lend themselves to a very interesting ex examination of civic space. So the Global Peace Index is in its 13th year. It ranks 163 countries and territories according to their relative states of negative peace which is the absence of violence or the absence of the fear of violence. And I'll come back to this definition throughout. It's a composite index that uses 23 indicators on a weighted scale of one to five. One are the most peaceful, five are the least. So perhaps the opposite of what you would expect. And it covers about 99.7% of the world's population. So those 23 indicators fall across three domains, ongoing domestic and international conflict, societal safety and security, and militarization. And as you'll see, we include both internal and external factors and qualitative and quantitative indicators. So this is what a map of the 2019 Global Peace Index looks like. Countries in green are more peaceful than countries in red. And this captures data roughly from March 2018 to March 2019. In terms of the big takeaways, to the surprise of many, we see that the average level of global peacefulness improved by, a point, by about 0.09% in this year's Global Peace Index. 86 countries improved, 76 countries deteriorated. And this was actually the highest number of countries to improve in peacefulness in any single year since the 2013 GPI. Looking at the results by domain, also perhaps popular, contrary to popular assumptions, the militarization domain improved, as did the societal safety and security domain. Ongoing conflict had a slight deterioration. Now, people are also always interested in which countries rank at the top and the bottom of the index. Iceland, again, remains the world's most peaceful country. This is a rank it's held since 2008. And then on the bottom of the index, for the first time, Afghanistan is the country that scores the lowest on the Global Peace Index. Previously, Syria had held that rank for many years, and Syria has seen the most significant decline of any country since we created the index. This is also the first year that Yemen ranks among the five least peaceful countries. Now we also look at the countries that improve and deteriorate the most. We see Ukraine at the top of the improvements. I just want to note that these countries that improve the most may be doing something well, or it may be that they have just ceased to be experiencing such extreme violence, which really speaks to the importance of looking at both the negative and the positive peace sides. Nicaragua is the country to have deteriorated the most. And then looking at results by region, we see four regions have improved. Russia and Eurasia, the MENA region, uh, Middle East and North Africa, Asia Pacific, and Europe. Now we also look at trends in peace, so changes over time. And we see that since 2008, the average level of global peacefulness declined by about 3.79%. 81 countries improved, 81 countries deteriorated. And while that deterioration is not limited to any particular indicator or country, much of the deterioration was driven by conflict in the Middle East. This just shows that overall trend since 2008. As I mentioned, countries with a lower score have greater levels of peacefulness. So although the chart is perhaps a bit unintuitive, this shows a decline in peace since 2008. Now this is something that I think is really important to mention. This shows the growing inequality in peacefulness, whereby the most peaceful countries are generally maintaining their levels of peace. The 25 most pe peaceful countries have improved by about 1.7% since 2008, whereas the least peaceful countries have deteriorated on average by about 11.7%. So those least peaceful countries are becoming even more violent and insecure. We also include some thematic sections of every Global Peace Index, and this year we looked at perceptions of well-being, um, standard of living, safety, drawing from data from the Gallup World Poll. And something that I found particularly interesting is perceptions of safety, particularly feeling safe walking alone at night. And we see that in low peace and very low peace countries, 
People are less likely to feel safe walking alone at night, so perhaps what you'd expect. But we also see a notable disparity in how women and men feel walking alone. And that disparity is highest among very high peace countries. In particular, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and Portugal. Switzerland is the only country where w women and men report feeling equally safe at night. Now, a major research um, interest within the, within the institute is the economic cost of violence. So each year, we estimate the cost of containing, preventing, and dealing with the cost of violence. And we see that in the 2019 GPI, that figure is about $14.1 trillion, which is about 11% of global GDP. We also look at the countries, the countries that are at the bottom of the index. For the 10 least peaceful countries, violence accounts for, on average, 35% of their GDP as compared to the 10 most peaceful countries for which violence accounts for about 3.3%. We see the Syrian economy um, is, has the greatest impact of violence, and that's about 67%, followed by Afghanistan and Central African Republic. Now, if you, like me, like to imagine where that money could be redirected to, just a 1% reduction in the global cost of violence would be about equivalent to all foreign aid in 2017. A 10% reduction in the cost of violence would be equivalent to what would be the world's third largest economy. Now, so far I've focused on negative peace in the context of the Global Peace Index, and I want to shift to positive peace and the question of what really creates peace over time. So from the perspective of IEP, it's not enough to look at merely uh, violence or the risk of violence, but we want to look at what builds peaceful, resilient societies over time. Positive peace represents the attitudes, the institutions, and the structures that permit us to create and sustain peaceful societies. And correlation analysis of some several thousand data sets has permitted us to identify the underlying mechanisms that empirically correlate to lasting peace. And the result is this eight-part framework of interrelated, interdependent factors that we call the eight pillars of positive peace. I'll run through them. They're a well-functioning government. This includes government and judicial effectiveness and the extent to which citizens have a role in decision-making. Equitable distribution of resources, not only income, but also land, education, and so forth. Free flow of information, this is tremendously important for peace. It captures citizens' capacity to access independent, accurate media and information about what's happening around them. Good relationships with neighbors, this c captures a country's capacity to use diplomacy to mitigate conflict. High levels of human capital, a population's collective skills and education that can be harnessed for economic output. Um, acceptance of the rights of others, and this includes both formal structures and also social norms, so essentially human rights. Low levels of corruption, also incredibly important. Uh, corruption tracks very closely with breakdowns in peacefulness. And then also a well-functioning government. Oh, excuse me, a sound business environment. And this includes supporting infrastructure that is good for business. Now, you're probably thinking that this is a very intuitive model, and I would agree. But it's novel in that this is the first empiric attempt of its scope to really capture the presence of these positive factors from a quantitative lens. And as you can imagine, positive peace tracks very closely with other desirable um, aspects of human development, gender equality, environmental sustainability, higher levels of GDP. And in that sense, it's also a measure of societal resilience. So countries with high levels of peace tend to be more resilient to shocks and to be able to resolve conflict in, an, in a, a non-violent manner. Now, these shocks can be economic, they can be political, and they can also come, for instance, from extreme weather. And this is something that I want to touch on, not because it's necessarily germane to civic space, but because it's a new chapter that we've included in this year's GPI that I think is important. So we did some research looking at climate change and peace. And what we've seen is that about 400 million people live in areas with low levels of peace and high risk for climate change. I see many of you nodding. Climate change doesn't automatically lead to higher levels of violence, but it can exacerbate existing conflict um, around social dynamics, migration, uh, resources, food, and so forth. And in the face of extreme climate 
uh, hazards, high levels, high peace countries tend to have stronger coping capacities than low peace. So again, a measure of resilience. And I want to share with you just one data point. What we see here is that the frequency of natural disasters between low and high peace countries is roughly about the same, that's the chart on the left, but fatalities from natural disasters occur at a rate of 13 to 1 between low and, peace, low and high peace countries. So evidently countries with high levels of positive peace are better equipped to cope with climate, um, extreme climate changes. Now, at IEP, we produce an annual positive peace index using similar methodology as the global peace index. We measure 163 countries and territories uh, based on a 24 indicator scale. We have three indicators for each of those eight pillars of positive peace. And from that research, we can look at the relationship between negative peace, so the global peace index, and positive peace. And I'll share one point that I think is relevant to this conversation. We see that there's a positive correlation between global peace rankings and positive peace rankings, such that generally when a country improves on one, they improve on the other. And that's in part by, the, by design, based on how we've developed the positive peace framework. And yet, some countries fare much better or worse on their global peace index score than their positive peace index would suggest. And I think of relevance to us today, it's worth noting what's called a positive peace deficit, where countries rank much better on the global peace index than on the positive peace index. And what this means is that they're not necessarily experiencing extreme outward violence, but they lack the supporting infrastructure in the presence of those supporting factors, positive peace, and thus they are more vulnerable to shocks. And I think that this is important because it's not always the countries that we would suspect. The data indicates that over the last decade, countries with positive peace deficits were significantly more likely to deteriorate and to increase levels of violence within, a few, within just a few years. And countries that notably improve on the global peace index had generally seen improvements across numerous positive peace indicators. So I think if we're looking at only the negative peace side, we're likely missing some important indications of potential future conflict. Whereas positive peace draws out the dimensions of society that prevent breakdowns, including social breakdowns and interpersonal violence that we're seeing around the world. So with that, I'm very excited to shift over to the panel to hear about some of their observations between the relationships um, of peace and civic society. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lori, um, and thanks again to everyone for being here today. I'm going to quickly introduce the panelists, give a few remarks myself about why we're talking about civic space today, um, and then turn it over to them. So we'll start today with Shannon Green, who is in the middle. Um, Shannon is actually my predecessor here at, at CSIS. She's a former director of the Human Rights Initiative, and she's now the senior director of programs at the Center for Civilians in Conflict, or CIVIC. She also had a long and distinguished career at USAID. To her right is Jonathan Drimmer. Um, Jonathan's a partner in the investigations of white collar defense practice at Paul Hastings, which is a law firm here in Washington. But until very recently, he was the deputy general counsel and chief compliance officer at Barrett Gold, which is a large mining company with operations in many complicated places around the world. And I know him because he's an expert on business and human rights. And on the far left, we have Stephen Lennon. He's the senior policy advisor to USAID's Bureau of Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Affairs. And he has years of work in post-conflict situations. He, until recently, was the director of, the US agents, of USAID's Office of Transition Initiatives. And before that, was with IOM for a decade. So there's really amazing expertise on this panel. One other thing I should know is we'll have questions at the end, and you can ask them both of the panel and Lori. So all those questions you have about the GPI, you'll have a, you'll have a time to, to ask. So why are we talking about civic space? If you read the GPI in detail, which you should do, um, you won't see a mention of civic space in it. But when Lori approached me about potentially helping them launch the GPI, I read both the GPI and the Positive Peace Index. And I was actually really fascinated by the Positive Peace Index. 
First, for the reasons that Lori laid out, that in a way, if we look at the positive peace index, we can see what the policy interventions are that different countries need to either increase their peacefulness or not lose their already good state of peacefulness, right? And it gives you this incredible base of knowledge to actually make much smarter policy decisions. But I was also really intrigued, because if you read it in detail, there's the eight pillars, and then under them, there's a lot of indicators. And a number of those indicators, um, to me, seem to link to civic space in different ways. So I'll talk about that a little bit. And as a starting point, I'm guessing most people in the audience know what I'm talking about when I say civic space, but I'll give kind of a rough description of it. It's the physical, social, online, offline space av available to individuals or organizations to express themselves and act, right? So certain rights like freedom of expression and assembly are particularly important for civic space, but it's broader than that. And what we're seeing, which many of you I'm sure have paid attention to, is this decline in space for civil society writ broad to act around the world. It's linked to rises in populism and authoritarianism. So when we see closing civic space, like this is done in a number of different ways. I'll just touch on a few of them. Some are very technical, like really burdensome registration laws for NGOs, or requiring NGOs getting foreign funding to register as foreign agents, which makes it easy to demonize them. But another very common trend is restrictions on freedom of expression or assembly. So particularly, we see increasing attacks on journalists around the world, and this will tie back to the Positive Peace Index. We also see increasing attacks on marginalized groups, like LGBTI groups. We assume that closing civic space worsens certain problems, like corruption or cronyism, or a weak judiciary, um, and, and generally rule of, of, of rule of law. And, and the thinking behind that is if there aren't people to criticize a government, <clears throat> the government can do whatever it wants. And usually that's not a good situation. So why, how does the Positive Peace Index connect to this, to this conversation? Well, I noticed that a number of factors associated with deteriorating civic space were also indicators in the GPI and were connected with declining peace. So I think there's an interesting question that the Positive Peace Index doesn't try to answer, but does declining civic space also correlate with decreases in peace? So I'll tell you why I think these are interesting questions. So they found that several factors were associated with deteriorating scores on Positive Peace Index. Those include press freedom, corruption, group grievances, and rule of law all of which have a tie into civic space. Also, they found that constraints on press freedom are a precursor to substantial falls in peace. So again, this is one of those key factors in closing civic space when you know things are gonna get pretty bad. Um, 17 of the 20 countries with the largest fall on the Positive Peace Index also had negative scores on the World Press Freedom Index. Not surprisingly, the Positive Peace Index report says that populism is driving down the scores in many European countries where we also see closing civic space. And last, of the top 50 countries in the, po in the Positive Peace Index, two are authoritarian out of the 50. And the top 10, which have been very stable, are all liberal democracies. So this suggests that there are correlations to me, right? This is not proven by their report, but there are interesting correlations between civic space and peace that maybe we should think about more and bring different fields together. <clears throat> That's why I'm excited about this panel, because it really brings people with different backgrounds into one place. The other really interesting element of the Positive Peace Index is that it indicates that progress on only certain of the eight pillars actually can be destabilizing. So, and I think this has really interesting implications for both the business sector and policymakers. So um, an improvement in the economy basically needs to be accompanied by improvements in levels of corruption and a well-functioning government, or it can actually lead to greater unrest. So I think it points to the fact that we need to integrate different areas, areas of policy, that just focusing, for example, on the economy can actually be destabilizing, which may be counterintuitive to some. So on that note, I want to move to the panelists because they are going to have great things to say. Um, Shannon, you're an expert on civic space. You led CSIS's work on that. You're also an expert on conflict. So does space for civil society, civil society matter in a conflict or post-conflict society? Great, thanks Amy. Um, I want to thank CSIS for hosting us and also congratulate IEP on the launch of their latest GPI report. I've actually been involved in the launch of three or four, maybe five of these over the course of the last couple of years and I really found this one to be the richest in terms of really tying together the analysis on negative peace and positive peace. 
the analysis that you provided on the economic impact of suicide and then the inclusion of climate change. So congratulations um, to our colleagues at IEP. So now I'll answer your question. Um, so obviously the most uh, germane or um, salient relationship between closing space and conflict is on an NGO's ability to operate in a conflict setting. So we're all familiar with challenges to the del delivery of humanitarian assistance, the challenges that development agencies and programs have had when space is constricting, and also the challenges that human rights organizations have had monitoring violations in conflict settings. However, in the past couple of years, we've also come to understand the vital role that civil society can play in supporting sustainable peace and engaging in peace building. So I want to be very clear that governments bear the primary responsibility to protect civilians and address insecurity. But the complexity and scale of conflicts that we see these days really means that no government alone can solve all these challenges. They need a robust, vibrant civil society to help them address the underlying causes of conflict. And we've seen in many places civil society rise to that challenge. So civil society and conflict environments can help civilians articulate their needs, their expectations, their preferences to armed actors and to the government. They can help facilitate engagement across um, conflict divides. They can encourage the participation <coughs> of women in peace building processes and negotiations. And they can ultimately help confront these root causes or underlying factors that exacerbate and fuel conflict. Um, so it should be evident to all of us that closing space really limits the ability of civil society to play this important peace building role. Just this week alone, I've heard about two very prominent international organizations in two different war-torn countries that are desperately trying to fend off efforts by government authorities to shut them down. This is the reality of organizations such as my own that work in complex settings. If the government is unhappy with your work for whatever reason, then they have a lot of tools, as Amy mentioned, that they can use to shut you down. But the GPI points to other much more complicated interactions between an enabling environment for civil society and peacefulness, and really helps us start to understand why closing space for civil society poses a threat to peace. And I really want to focus these couple of minutes on that point. So, as the reports um, and the Positive Peace Report makes clear, peace is much more than just the absence of violence. It really represents a, a state or a status where societies can thrive and develop intellectually, culturally, materially, um, and in a harmonious and cohesive manner. The approach that IEP takes um, to positive peace points out all of the ways that those different factors interact in this really dynamic system in order to promote peace. And I would suggest that civil society is at the heart of that system. And when civil society comes under attack, positive peace suffers, over time contributing to a deterioration in peacefulness. And that's because the role that civil society can play in an ideal scenario is an, as an intermediary between the citizenry and government. In many places, civil society really plays this like a central role in helping organize citizens, aggregate their expectations, their needs, and their preferences, and communicate those to policymakers and government officials. In turn, civil society plays a really important role in holding government accountable for delivering on those preferences and expectations. Ideally, this dynamic, if, you know, if allowed to flourish, can foster better communication and ultimately more trust in the government and government institutions. As Amy mentioned, a free press is essential to this virtuous cycle. And as you know, many reports have made clear, we're really seeing a decline in the free flow of information, which is essential for better decision making and more rational responses to moments of crisis and really dealing with those shocks that Laura mentioned. The other thing about civil society and I think how it relates to positive peace is that ideally, again, it augments the expertise, ingenuity, and ability to problem solve of governments. 
So anybody who's ever served in a government, myself included, knows that government does not have a monopoly on good ideas. Um, <laughs> and in fact, it can be very challenging to have that kind of entrepreneurship and creativity within government. All of society needs to be involved in addressing the really complex problems that are facing us in the global arena. And if civil society is really operating with all these restrictions, they can't play that role of being um, a helper, really, and helping come up with these new ideas and ways of addressing problems. In particular, I think um, the report's focus on climate change really makes this point like very evident. Those countries that are better able to manage climate-induced shocks and have higher environmental performance are those in which civil society is allowed to flourish, is allowed to contribute to addressing those problems. When restrictive NGO laws are passed, when civil society organizations are shut down on trumped up charges, when activists are put in jail, when media outlets are bought out by government loyalists, the ability of civil society to contribute to the attitudes, structures, and institutions that create and sustain peaceful societies is severely diminished. So hopefully I've made the argument that a, a strong enabling environment for civil society is intimately linked to positive peace. I do want to mention two caveats, because I don't think it's fair to paint too rosy of a picture. And I would say if we were having this conversation a couple of years ago, I would be much more um, unadulterated in my um, support for the role of civil society in fostering peacefulness. And I do still believe that it is absolutely essential for civil society to have an unimpeded, vibrant role in society. But I do want to point to two vulnerabilities that have become much more evident in the past year. And that is how conflict entrepreneurs are using civil society to foment discord, grow polarization, and contribute to conflict. The first way they do that is by taking advantage of free and open spaces to manipulate public sentiment and to push people to the extremes. I think it's become a, tru a truism in our political discourse that democratic societies are more susceptible or vulnerable to this kind of interference or intervention. GPI talks about growing polarization in the US and Brazil, and certainly much of that is of our own making, right? So like, it's not as if these societies didn't already have polarization that could be exacerbated. Yet there has been ample documentation of how Russia and now other actors are taking advantage of a vibrant civil society and the free flow of information in our societies to increase political pol polarization. Um, and this was obviously very prominent in the lead up to the last presidential election. Examples abound of this on both sides of the political spectrum. So this is in a partisan argument. We are aware now of uh, fake accounts that were set up on Facebook in order to um, give the impression that communities were, like, that there was a lot of momentum within communities for hate um, and division. We're aware of protests that were called on politically dis divisive issues by agents of other governments in New York, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Texas, and elsewhere. And this is not just in the US. Um, so I have a colleague who runs an organization called the Alliance for Securing Democracy. They have tracked the Russian government's interference efforts in 40 different countries across the Atlantic. Um, and what they have found are hundreds, hundreds of instances of just Russia, and I think the same could be said about other countries, really trying to sort of foment discord and polarization within societies. So it's something that we have to be mindful of. The second is that um, civil society in some places has become just another battleground for conflict and contestation. In many places, not all, civil society has become as polarized as politics. And what I mean is that different political parties and factions have really been able to continue to duke it out in the public square on social media and through civil society organizations that are affiliated with them. In this sense, civil society isn't an antidote to conflict, but rather an, ex an extension or accelerant of it. Of course, these arguments are very uncomfortable to me because they're the same ones that some governments make 
as to the need to regulate, monitor, and control civil society. Um, and that's not what I'm saying at all. If anything, I think these are reasons to have an even more vibrant civil society, to deepen efforts to ensure the true independence of the sector, and to foster greater transparency within civil society. Only then do I believe that civil society can reach its full potential to contribute to positive peace and greater, greater peacefulness. Thanks so much, Shannon. That was really interesting. And obviously, yes, this points at the end make me uncomfortable, too. Um, I do think there's some interesting examples of, around the ability to really focus on education as a way of getting around that. Right? So Finland has this great, apparently great program on countering violent extremism where they educate their students who are much smarter about like, what do they read online and understanding whether it's legitimate and who the actors are that posted it. Yep. So I think there's a whole, for democracies, there's a really important role around educating ourselves to be better citizens and therefore able to support appropriate civil society. Exactly, it's about being more a more discerning consumer of the information that you're receiving, which can actually lead to more vibrant civil society if people are more civically engaged in asking those questions. Yeah. Great. We're going to turn to Stephen now. Stephen, you've worked in so many countries who are in conflict or coming out of conflict for years. Um, so sometimes it's my sense that that creating space for civil society may not be like the first priority in those situations. So how can we do this better? Um, okay, so I'll answer your question, but first I need to respond to a couple of things Shannon said. The, uh, because it made me uncomfortable being a government employee because we work with civil society all over the world uh, to effectuate and promote US government foreign policy. So we're in this space as well. Um, and we need to be very cautious and ethical about that, and we are. Um, but it always gives me a little bit of pause on the groups that we end up working with because we are choosing them and we're not choosing others. So there's a lot of examples where the US government is on one side of a political debate and we're there. Um, but I'm always struck by, uh, first of all, I, I believe there's civil societies teeming around the world. In the US government, we often only define it very narrowly, and we need to think broader about it. Um, it's very easy to get captured by big NGOs, which, which are great, um, and miss all of the rest of civil society that's out there. If we structure the way that we do our business, and I'm going to talk a bit about my former office, um, if we structure how we procure in government, um, because it's one of the biggest limiting factors that government has, and I'm not just talking about our government, but governments around the world, when they're trying to work with their own civil societies, have a, usually have a procurement problem. Uh, very gets very bureaucratic, they trip over themselves, and they don't get out and talk to all the civil society that's out there. If you create procurements, this is how you can do it. Um, I'm going to get a bit wonky. Um, I, I probably already am. Um, but uh, if you create a procurement that allows you, through grants, to work with additional civil society you work with more civil society and you don't get captured by just the local uh, people in the capital. So it's doable. My office, uh, my former office, OTI, the Office of Transition Initiatives, created a, a structure of uh, working under contracts doing grants, which opens the aperture greatly of who you can work with. But in addition, we, we uh, structured a thing called in-kind grants. So you don't pay people, give civil society money, you give them in-kind assistance, which opens the aperture dramatically and you can work with almost anybody. It's very uh, intensive to manage those things, but it, it can be done and it opens the aperture. And that allows you uh, not to get around laws that draconian governments are setting up, but to work with the civil society that's not even on their books, right? Anybody. Um, it is teeming out there and we, we can work with it. So it's this in-kind structure that's very, very important. I see as uh, closed space is growing, we are getting more risk adverse in the government and in, throughout all of the people that the government works with. And that, that's a problem. 
We're, we are very, very risk adverse. When I started in this uh, industry back in the mid 90s, it wasn't like this, but increasingly every single year the regulations get tighter and our risk aversion goes up and up. Shannon's familiar with this. Um, also, government and civil society, if you only work with one, and, and generally in foreign assistance when there's a conflict, we want to go in and work with a new government, the government that we want to work with, and we do it at a very high level. And we forget, and, and the very high level with civil society, and we forget all of the others. That's, that's, we need to do that, but if we don't do them together, it's going to fail. And, and we keep doing this around the world. I must say these are my comments, not the government's comments, um, because I'm being critical of the government a bit, um, which I think is good. I mean, we need to be critical of ourselves. So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks so much. I think that really touches on um, some of the challenges we see. Again, with closing civic space, one of the issues, right, is that it's very easy to paint NGOs and countries elites, right, because these large NGOs getting lots of foreign funding. And, and if we're able to bring in other NGOs and strengthen them, or not even formal NGOs, right, grassroots movements, et cetera, then that sort of changes that dynamic in a way that we know is needed, right, and also make, helps ensure that after the international community has flipped its attention to the next conflict, something's left yeah. in that country that's vibrant. Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Jonathan. Um, Jonathan obviously comes from a background in business as well as law. And um, I think sometimes among some businesses, I don't think this is true for Barrick, where you were previously, but some businesses, I think, at least historically, would have argued, you know, our, bus our job is just to like increase GDP. We're done. You know, governance is not really our problem. Um, what's your reaction to that? What is the appropriate role of business in terms of supporting governance and civic space? And is that changing as we see the world move in a more sort of authoritarian direction? Yeah, I think it is changing. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, I, I, do, I do think businesses are becoming much more sophisticated, not only as they see geopolitical shifts, but also as they see more examples of, of getting things wrong. But let me take a step back and talk a little bit about how businesses do think um, in, in terms of operating in uh, overseas challenging uh, locations. Um, as businesses do consider where to make investments, where to put not just their money, but also their people uh, and their property, uh, what, what they really do thrive on is predictability and stability. Business looks for predictability and stability. When they're looking to make overseas investments, they look at it from a social standpoint, a political standpoint, and a rule of law standpoint. <clears throat> they anticipate some level of variation, some swing. It's not going to be a, a, a snapshot that they know will always exist, but they're going to anticipate a band of shifting. And that is the level of predictability and stability uh, they ultimately want. And predictability, stability requires stable institutions. And that's a fundamental um, precept of any uh, stable uh, society. Now, I, I, I should say, there, and to be fair, and to your point, Amy, I mean, there are businesses that do think about things in terms of short term. They think about short term benefits from weak rule of law where they can get laws that sway strongly to their favor. They can think about short term benefits from weak courthouses where they can get unjust rulings that go in their favor. But that's not how long term, that's not a long term pattern uh, for success. That is not something that ultimately is going to lead uh, a business to thrive over the long term because any sophisticated business knows today and I do think this is part of the learning curve, that pendulums swing. So you're in favor today, you're associated with uh, a, a, a leadership today, but that doesn't last. Um, and if you are taking advantage and be seen, and you're seen to be taking advantage of uh, weaknesses, whether it's from rule of law, political or otherwise, uh, that is something that, that is going to come back uh, to haunt you uh, in different uh, ways. So how do we connect this to civic space? Well, civic space ultimately as we know, increases uh, peace, and peace is what leads to stability and the predictability that businesses ultimately uh, do look for. Um, a lack of uh, democratic participation, as we heard, ultimately can lead uh, to violence, and that violence ultimately uh, can target and will target uh, businesses when they are too closely associated uh, with uh, ruling uh, regimes. Um, the business itself can be targeted. 
its people can be targeted when they're off duty, its property can be targeted, it ultimately can lead to threats against the vitality of the overseas investment itself. We also know that uh, in without peace, without stable institutions, corruption flourishes. And that corruption, talk about the bottom line for companies, that gets right to company bottom line. You do have local leaders, local politicians, others that are siphoning profits, that are siphoning aspects of the business, and also threatens to, to undermine the long-term vitality uh, of an overseas uh, investment. Um, we also know that companies, even when they're thinking they're trying to do the right thing by having various uh, programs to benefit local communities with a weak civic space, weak civil society, um, those, uh, those benefits can also get, get siphoned and misdirected, which will have the perverse effect of creating um, anger at the company. It ultimately makes resentment at the company because they are seen as only contributing uh, to uh, the moral degradation and ultimately uh, the profits that, that land in the pockets of the wrong people. So those things can ultimately backfire. Uh, and then finally, you know, bear in mind that you, you know, strong local civic society, civil society benefits local communities. And, and the company is comprised of people who for 16 hours a day live in those local communities and eight hours a day come to work uh, for them. So they can see the ultimate harms that come to their very employees that form uh, the crux uh, of their overseas uh, operations. So how do you start? What should companies do? What shouldn't they do? Uh, well, the first rule that I always um, uh, suggest when I'm talking to businesses, and certainly when I was, when I was at Barrick, is the single importance of tending to your own garden. So when we think about what businesses, first and foremost, should be doing, ultimately, to promote uh, a strong uh, civic space to promote the participation of civil society organizations, have robust anti-corruption and human rights programs. Do not contribute uh, to uh, the problem yourself. That's something you ultimately uh, can uh, control. Don't try to enact obviously unjust laws just because you might have in that moment um, strong uh, political influence. If you make a mistake, own up to it. Don't take advantage of the fact that you might be able to get away with a, a mistake that other people can't because of your position of power. Have remedy programs, have grievance mechanisms that do allow you to correct and deal with issues um, when, you will, when you do have some level of responsibility uh, for them. And so, you know, first and foremost, if you want to see stable institutions, be a stable institution yourself. Beyond that, <clears throat> and basically a, a corollary, is don't undermine civic space. Don't undermine civic space. Don't take unduly aggressive action against people who uh, might question your operations. Encourage debate. Be transparent in your operations and encourage a robust uh, dialogue around what you're doing and how it is that you're doing it. Look for those opportunities uh, to promote dialogue where you can. Look for those opportunities to share your approaches, share your successes and your lack of successes with uh, the local communities uh, in which you uh, operate. Don't encourage governments to crack down on those who might question uh, what, what you're doing, but ultimately try to be a moderating influence when government uh, is, is looking to take that kind of action um, that, that can not only affect your operations, but ultimately the operations of others in the larger business space. And the final point is on the larger level, um, you know, if you're operating in a country that has an autocratic regime, if you are operating in a challenging jurisdiction, you know, keep an arm's length with the government. I'm not saying don't operate there. I'm not saying you can't be in a place where there's a weak rule of law, et cetera. But don't cozy up too much uh, to the government because in the long term, that's ultimately going to come back uh, to haunt you. Jonathan, I have a question, which is, I, I think that was all really interesting and fairly intuitive for me because I've worked on the nexus of business and human rights for years. But I guess one question that's been coming up is, again, as we enter this more difficult time from the perspective of governance, right? Should companies be doing more? Like, I remember years ago, I think it was Statoil was providing money to, for some NGO to train judges in Venezuela. It's a long time ago, a different Venezuela. But, um, but is that appropriate? Should we be looking for business to do more of that? What, what do you think? I don't know that you can look for business. I think it's a good business. Um, I think it's a good business decision, uh, things along those lines, looking to promote, actively promote and build infrastructure, whether it is training judges or magistrates or investigators or courthouses or allowing greater forums for civic discussion. I, I think that is something smart businesses do. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we're at a point where 
we can affirmatively say we expect a business to operate in that, but you certainly see leading businesses do it, and it is a matter of best practice. I think the more we talk about it, the more we promote it, I do think it'll become more ingrained in the expectations we have for responsible businesses. Yeah, and I, I do think it's sort of, there are benefits to the business itself in the long run, right? It takes a long-term long view. Um, I'd also say I think there needs to be a lot of transparency when that's happening, right? Because otherwise it can start to look, it could look dubious otherwise. No question. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to Shannon and Stephen if you can't answer the question. Just I think one of the takeaways, both from the GPI and the Positive Peace Index, is that when we look at countries and sort of where they sit on peacefulness, there's a need to work on multiple areas at the same time. So what are some of the biggest barriers? Let's talk about the US government or other governments. What are the biggest barriers to, do, to doing that? And are any of those easily tweaked or removed? I'll start. <laughs> I know it's a hard um, yeah, this is what I was trying to get at when I, when I spoke, is that we uh, have great restrictions on who we can work with. And that's a challenge. And our government probably has the best mechanisms to work with civil society uh, of any government. Um, uh, we're definitely the big, biggest in foreign assistance around the world. But we, we do restrict ourselves, and we have to find ways to loosen that up. And I think we're actively doing that. Um, but it's, it's our own regulations that impede us at times and keep us working with just the usual suspects. And, and that's great. We should work with the usual suspects. And what I mean by that is a big local NGO who knows the US government well, can talk to them, understands how to apply for things, et cetera. But there's this great un, uh, untapped civil society out there that we miss. And so our biggest challenge is ourselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I have two different ways of looking at that question, I think. I mean, one is what is the biggest barrier to increasing positive peace within the US? I don't know if you intended it that way, but I'm going to help <laughs> interpret it that way. Um, and I would say the, you know, the political polarization in our society is really becoming an acute challenge to peacefulness. You know, we have these very hardened views that make it very difficult to find the common ground between different positions. And I think that this is a significant vulnerability that the both the GPI and the Positive Peace um, Index point out. When you look at the fact that the U.S. is in orange on that map, it is. It is really scary, it is really troubling. Um, and it's not that we don't have the capacity to do better, but the fact that we just have this growing sense of polarization and everything is like an existential, you know, take it to them that kind of problem is really impeding our ability to problem solve. Um, so that's the first thing. In terms of the way that the US supports civil society abroad out there, I mean, similar to what Stephen was saying, um, I think one of the challenges, I mean, it's a reality and it's a challenge. The U.S. government spends U.S. taxpayer money to um, implement projects that, are, that is in the U.S. interest, right? And because of that, um, it skews the kinds of organizations that we work with, as Stephen mentioned, and I think does make them vulnerable to this charge that they are just merely um, advancing a foreign agenda. And I don't mm. think that's always the case, but I do think it leaves them open to that. Um, so what I was focused on a lot when I was at CSIS was this idea of civil society organizations and civil society writ large, because it does go beyond the sort of formalized, organized organizations, finding different ways to mobilize funding and support for their cause so they are not so reliant on foreign actors, so that they can really, in practice and um, in terms of perception, demonstrate that they are working in the interests of society based on their own priorities. And I think the degree to which they have a funding base that comes from that society, it puts them in a much better position to make that argument. Great, thank you. Well, we've heard you know, great comments from the panel, but I do suspect there are a lot of questions in the room because we've covered really, between all of us, quite a spectrum of issues. Um, so I'd like to take three questions at a time. And we'll just start maybe with these gentlemen here. 
Can someone bring them a microphone? Can you put your hands back up? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Bob Berg, recent chairman of the Alliance for Peace Building. Wonderful briefing, Larry. Thank you so much, and thanks for this panel. Uh, the, two questions. One is uh, whether the, in our foreign policy we ought to have incentives or disincentives relating to a country's treatment of its civil society. And Laurie, I'd be interested in what you're taking from this discussion and your report to present to the UN next month in the high level review of the Sustainable Development Goal on Peace, number 16. Thank you. Great. I think there was a question right next to him, so we'll get both of those at the same time. <clears throat> I'm Chick Dombach, uh, used to be with Bob, <laughs> that's why we sit together, and on the board of, of the Institute for Economics and Peace and several other things. Uh, every year when this comes out, and I've been part of it every year when it comes out, and I'm always interested in the policy implications for the U.S. government coming out of this report, and I'd be interested in any of your thoughts on what, not if, but when we do congressional briefings. What is the main message coming out of this year's study, this year's analysis, this year's conclusions that, that would have an impact on policy decisions of the U.S. government? If you were to be with us when we make those presentations, what would you say to the policymakers? Thank you. Okay, let's get one more question. Um, there's a question here. Thank you, great discussion. Doug Brooks, International Stability Operations Association, I'm contractors who support peacekeeping and stability operations. Uh, my question is really about the, um, uh, how this uh, report compares to the Fund for Peace's uh, f uh, Fragile States Index uh, in methodology and results. All right, well, um, I think the first question on incentives and disincentives regarding the treatment of civil society, would anyone like to pick that up? I think it's an interesting question. Yeah, yes, several um, people. We'll just go down the road. Yeah, uh, very quickly, uh, great question. I think in all the countries I've worked in, both when I was with the UN and with the US government, the, the, the policy has always been, please incentivize to the government so that they keep civil society as open as possible and don't regulate it. Um, a, a great example is in Burma, um, where the U.S. government, uh, when the new government came in, it really didn't understand its own civil society, right, because it was new and it was just kind of opening up. And so they wanted to put some fairly draconian laws in, on the books, and the U.S. government got behind civil society and helped organize them to speak to the government so that they wouldn't do that, and it was successful. That's just one example. Yeah, so I have long been a fan of creating incentives and disincentives for an enabling environment for civil society, tying things such as um, recognition of a government, state visits, all of sort of the pomp and circumstance that can come along um, to a government's performance when it comes to engagement with civil society and the degree to which they allow space. But another really important um, venue for incentives that I think we are leaving on the table is when it comes to security sector assistance for security cooperation. Um, and what I mean here is the decisions that we make about security cooperation, whether it be arms sales, training, and other forms of assistance are largely disconnected from the way that government treats civil society and are largely disconnected from the enabling environment for civil society. And yet, I would argue that having civil society oversight and engagement of security sector assistance is so important, and it's not happening routinely. So really having civil society um, able to monitor the way that those local partners and local security actors are using that assistance is essential. So I would like to see much more time of those two things together. Um, and I do think that that is potentially a stronger incentive or inducement that the U.S. government could be using to keep space open. Yeah, and you see that to some extent with the multilateral lending institutions and the way that they incentivize and, and, and track as well. Though, though the point I was going to make, and I think it might be a little bit different from the intent of the question, which may have been focused on policy, 
um, in terms of uh, government policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis bi bilateral um, approaches uh, is to business. And what we have seen in some countries is very effective use of um, discretionary government uh, services and purchasing in terms of the responsible conduct of business. So the government of Canada, for instance, this is something that I, I worked on at Barrick and, and have, have talked to the government about, and they do have a, an entire framework that exists for responsible business conduct that's tied to both carrots and sticks, including the absence, the lack of, the withdrawal of uh, foreign embassy assistance if you are seen not to be acting uh, responsibly as a business in your overseas activities. They've also tied it to procurement as well. So I, I think we have good examples uh, among other governments that are incentivizing business um, around responsible conduct that ultimately would encompass uh, the kinds of issues we're talking about here. Great. Laurie, there are a couple questions you may want to pick up on. Definitely. Um, so Bob, or uh, Chick, thanks for your question about SDG 16. Or Bob, sorry. I'm giving him credit for your question. So SDG 16 is Peace, Justice, and Inclusive Institutions, and it's up for review at the UN this July. We advocated very strongly for the inclusion of SDG 16, and we see, we see positive peace as an enabling environment to achieve not only SDG 16, but all of the SDGs. So we'll be awaiting that forum. And on July 16th, for those of you who will be in New York, we have a high-level political forum side event looking at SDG 16 in the Pacific, drawing from a report that we've done there with, a, uh, with Australia. So we'll be doing a much deeper dive um, in July. And then, Chick, to your question about uh, US policymakers, I think that the single um, takeaway that I would articulate is the importance of looking at how political stability is deteriorating peace in the US. And it's something that Shannon very aptly pointed out. I'm not sure that we always see the link between political instability and political divisions with conflict and violence, but political instability is one of the indicators that has most significantly deteriorated in the US in this GPI, so that's what I would emphasize. And then thanks for your question about the Fragile States Index. We always welcome um, complementary indices. I think the Fragile States Index measures much of what we're measuring, but all of the dimensions are not captured. Um, and there's some interesting analysis looking at how a lot of indices available that are measuring you know, fragility, conflict, and so forth do come up with some of the same, or, or, or I should say similar outcomes. Countries rank, rank similarly on these indices, but almost from a normative standpoint, IEP places great emphasis that what we're really trying to measure is peace or the absence of peace. So I think that that is one arena that, uh, or one, one aspect that sets us apart. Great. Um, are there more questions? There's a question here. And then another over here. We can it. If any women in the audience have questions, they'd be welcome. Thank you, Mushtaba, with the Free Muslim Center for Deradicalization and Extremism Prevention. You mentioned 163 countries are in, uh, in the report. What leaves out the rest of 32 countries uh, in the globe? And if it is lack of information, can we use the eight indicators for, for positive index to reverse engineer if it's lack of relations with the neighbors, if it's other things, other indicators that we can draw a conclusion from that place or that country. Thank you. There's a question here. Uh, good morning, Aaron Gershowitz, uh, formerly with uh, HIAS, a refugee organization. And um, my question is regarding the US, I was surprised to see that it was ranked low al along with such uh, you know, unstable places as Venezuela and Myanmar and ranking higher than El Salvador from which thousands of people are fleeing violence and coming to the US. So my question is, does that say something about how we should be more alarmed about what's happening in the US and it's like a canary in the coal mine? Or does it say something about the way that the index is being calibrated and have you looked at this to see why it fell out the way it did? Absolutely. Any more questions right now? All right, we'll start with what we got. Um, so I think, Lori, several of those really go, go to you. Excellent. So I'll work backwards. 
So the US scores a five, which, is, and first of all, thanks for the, the question. The US scores a five, which is the worst um, score possible on four indicators, and that is nuclear weapons, external conflicts fought, incarceration, and um, military expenditure. So that, I think that that in part explains why it is as low as it is, and I would also note that we're looking at both internal and external factors. So Central American countries, if I could generalize, fare uh, less well internally, but they're not as involved in external conflicts, and so that is one of the reasons why we see the, low, the US uh, scoring so, so poorly this year. And then on the question of the 163 countries, the, the main reason why we don't include more countries is because countries with a very small population or a very small geography would skew the index. And so we try our best to, um, to impute data when it's not available for countries that are lacking data, but the question is, or the answer to your question is more um, due to geography and population size. And it does cover 97% right. of, of the population, essentially, right? Michael, Michael, do you want to say something from the floor? Oh, the <laughs> yes. Sorry, I didn't realize I was on the mic. But, um, you know, although, <laughs> although, it, although it does cover, uh, it does not cover all countries, it does cover, um, you know, 97% of the world's population for precisely the reasons that Laurie describes, that most of the countries that are not included are the ones that are generally uh, really, you know, small islands for the most part. And like she says, they skew the results. I think one really kind of interesting thing that I think links to what you were asking about as well is, and, and again, I'm going to talk more about the positive piece index, because I obviously spent a lot of time looking at it, but it's really interesting in the sense that they, they sort of put countries into different levels of peacefulness, and the pillars that it's most important to work on depend on where the, the country mm. falls in those different bands. So it's in that sense, that's why, like, from a policy perspective, it's really useful. It's not like... Every country needs, I mean, all eight pillars matter, but some matter more for different countries depending on where they fall on that index, which I think is fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's another question. Yes, here and then back there. Just shout it out. No, please take the <laughs> microphone because we're also live casting this. No, I, I just want to. Can you say, sorry, can you say your name and affiliation yeah, yeah. as well? Thank you so much. Andy Semmel, um, the various organizations in town. <laughs> um, I wanted to revisit Chick's question because I want, want to hear the panel be more specific or amplify on your response earlier. What would you, having done this uh, research, which is excellent, what would you say to a congressional hearing and Senate Foreign Relations Committee? Uh, uh, what policy implications, what specific recommendations would you make as, uh, based upon these empirical findings? Uh, there's another question back here. Hello, I am Kelly Clark with Search for Common Ground. And we've had a great conversation about how governments and business can support civil society. I was wondering if the panel had any suggestions for how international um, nonprofits could also support civil society, society abroad. Great, and there's one more question here. Let's pick this one up. Hi, my name is Benjamin Lutz. I'm a current IEP ambassador. So it's great to hear the GPA metrics again. Um, thanks, Lori, for all your help with setting up. Um, so one of the big things of the IEP ambassador program is to present my own piece research in line with the GPA metrics. And so as I prepare my presentation, I'm curious for the rest of the panel, how will you utilize these GPI findings in your own settings, your own work, your own policy proposals? One, because I kind of want to piggyback off the great work that you're doing, but also it helps prepare how I will present my own presentations and findings on the road. Thank you. All right. Does anyone want to pick up on the specific recommendations for Congress? I don't think it necessarily has to be Lori. Okay, well, pick up on the second one. Okay. Um, I think that's a really good question, and oftentimes we think about what governments can do, what the international community can do, but we don't look inward enough at ourselves to ask what we can do. Um, so I would say that there's two things um, that came out formerly in my research when I was here. The first one is about solidarity. Um, so where there have been instances where civil society has been able to push back on draconian laws um, and different administrative actions has been when the sector is really unified in its response. All the way from humanitarian organizations 
um, that are obviously, you know, very concerned about humanitarian principles and don't want to be seen as a political actor, to human rights organizations, LGBTI organizations, organizations that focus on transparency and accountability and are often the targets of attacks on civil society. Making sure that civil society views the enabling environment and space as a common good for all organizations and are acting in a unified way is super important, particularly if those organizations that are less controversial can take the lead in articulating why space needs to be kept open and can really make the case based on the services um, and support and you know, public goods that the organizations provide to society, but also the economic benefits of allowing civil society to continue to operate freely and independently. So the first is non-solidarity. The second is sometimes INGOs need to get out of the way. Um, and what I mean by that is if INGOs are always the ones that are capturing the resources, and then yeah, maybe like subgranting a little bit here and there, but if they're always the intermediary, it prevents local organizations from really being able to stand on their own two legs and thrive. And I think anybody who takes a hard look at our sector can see that there have been many, many, many decades of talking about capacity building. We need to really think hard about what is enough capacity building such that local organizations can take the lead, can receive the funding directly, and can really be sort of the ones that are um, have the direct relationship with donors. So those are the two things I would point to um, in terms of how we can help. Let me just add a little bit on that. Um, I totally agree with you. Um, but in addition, there's local business. When we talk about business, we're usually thinking about big American, European businesses going out and doing some social responsibility work but there's a lot more businesses that are in the countries that we're working in, and unifying them with civil society really, really helps. Uh, I would urge you all to Google I Am Karachi, which is a great unification of local government, and it's key that it's local government, a lot of business interests, and civil society in Karachi. They were all divided for decades, trying to get the crumbs of foreign assistance, but now they're united in their own sort of league. I am Karachi, it's a pretty good organization. I actually was recently looking at the I am Karachi webpage. I can't remember who told me to look at it, but it is really interesting. And it sort of has pushed from these, these organizations to also like push back against violence and extremism. Uh -huh. This really interesting coalition. I think it's something actually as human, sort of the human rights sector, I guess, mm -hmm. looks at how to engage business. I think local business is an area that we haven't looked at a lot. Um, sometimes local business, unfortunately, is part of the problem, but clearly not always, right? And so that's a really right. lost opportunity for civil society to build new allies. Well, and some research and reporting that CSIS did previously was about different models that civil society could, ad could adopt or could adapt to, given closing space. And one of them was acting more like a business in the sense of like really understanding what was the need in society? What are your, what's your market, so to speak? Um, and how can you be more entrepreneurial and make sure that as a civil society organization or entity that you're delivering something that people actually want and are willing to invest in? Um, so again, just you know, thinking differently about civil society is not just you know, organizations that are dependent on foreign donors, but as a really rich ecosystem um, that could be modeled in different ways. Yeah, the last thing I think I would say on that is um, greater engagement with uh, uh, international civil society organizations and businesses that are operating in um, the jurisdictions, autocratic jurisdictions, where we are starting to see a reduction in civic space would be a good idea. I think there isn't uh, a tremendous amount of dialogue between those groups or really business and government uh, or business and international institutions. And I do think greater levels of dialogue and understanding about what people are really seeing on the ground and the trends and what can be done to counteract it would, would be a, a smart series of discussions. Yeah, and that really changes, like requires a sort of a change in mindset, I think, from multiple actors who maybe historically have had more of a fraught relationship or no relationship. Lori? I just wanted to comment, Amy, on something that you said about the Positive Peace Report. I really appreciate how thoughtfully Amy has um, called through that report. 
And you mentioned the, the role of different pillars as countries, um, for countries that are facing low, mid, or high levels of peace. So that's a quite interesting analysis within the report. We also look at countries that are transitioning and some of the shared characteristics from countries who are transitioning, for instance, from mid to low levels of peace, um, or vice versa. And so the Positive Peace Report, as I mentioned, follows a similar methodology, and it comes out in October and November. So if you're curious for more, I encourage you to check out that report. Yes, I've been commenting on the 2018 one because the new one is not available yet. Also, just on the US, the US does substantially better on the Positive Peace Index, which is really interesting. <clears throat> there's most countries, it's not so different, but every now and then you see this huge difference. And the US, there's a significant difference. Any more questions? Anyone want to pick that one up? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, Sorry. I think, so I think what all of this points to, and I mean, it's your data, so, you know, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but like, the idea that these factors are interacting in this really complicated system, and to Amy's point of like, trying to isolate those variables in different geographies, that are the most directly related to growing positive peace before there's a crisis, right? So like, I view the positive peace index as almost like a precursor, you know, to where a country falls mm -hmm. on the GPI. So like really trying to make sure that in your foreign assistance, in your diplomatic engagements, that you're helping address those most salient factors in the ecosystem and not just like, going really deep on one and ignoring others that are directly related. So to me, it just talks, it speaks to the need to have much more flexibility in the way that we program our foreign assistance, to have like less of it tied, less of it subject to all these restrictions, and being able to be like much more agile in the way that we deal with prevention. And I would assume also some more interagency cooperation, right? Because, right, which is sort of what my question earlier yeah. I was trying to get at, but, um, Right, which is very hard, but sometimes it may be that you need to be working on both economic factors and, let's say, rule of law, right? And that those need to be in some way coordinated, um, which I know is hard, but it clearly is important. I mean, the one specific policy, you know, recommendation, or maybe it's two, that I would, I would suggest, uh, again, focusing on the business side uh, more than other potentially implicated uh, actors, would be to examine the incentive and disincentive systems that other countries have put into place. Um, whether it's Canada or, or otherwise, uh, the UK as well. Um, considering nudge theory and other public policy incentivization approaches uh, that have been used consistent with some, some of what other countries have done and thinking about what kind of a scheme of incentives would make sense uh, in the United States as it reflects uh, responsible business conduct um, overseas. Number two, in a related vein, um, to look at the sanctions regime and the Global Magnitsky Act obviously has had uh, an expansion in the way it's been thought about uh, and, and that might be another avenue to approach responsible business conduct as it relates to these areas and participation um, in, in the business community and in autocratic regimes. And when you so, talk, oh, no, I was going to, I want to throw the question <laughs> actually back at Lori. There were two things from the, from the index that like I don't know how to think about, and it sort of gets to this question. One is on militarization. So obviously the US government um, and this administration is pushing our NATO partners to increase their expenditures on defense. Mm -hmm. And because of the threats that they face from the near abroad, a lot of <coughs> European countries anyways are investing a lot more in security and defense. So in some corners, we see that as a good thing in terms of enhancing security and dealing with sort of the current threat environment. But in your index, it picks it up as a negative in the sense that more military expenditure leads to lower levels of peacefulness, right? Yes. So I, I, I wanted to explore that a little bit um, as a policy issue. And then the second thing that um, made me uncomfortable or I was struggling with was the Egypt question, um, which is, if we are pushing countries to have a very aggressive, robust, heavy-handed, however you want to describe it, security response in the short term that can actually contribute to more peacefulness. But in the long term, if it's happening against the backdrop of a lot of repression, I mean significant repression, 
Um, I would imagine that that would be picked up in lower levels of positive peace. So from a policy perspective, recognizing that what might be in the short term a way of addressing insecurity and having lower levels of violence or casualties might be in the long run exacerbating the very factors um, that are going to contribute to reduced stability or peacefulness in the future, I think is a really important you know, policy question to continue to have, especially when it comes to counterterrorism. Great. I might take a pass on the Egypt question because I think it would require me to look back on both the positive piece and the negative piece um, data on Egypt. But the militarization question is a good one and we get this often. IEP is not suggesting that military expenditure should be zero and military should be abolished, but we do, I, I do think it's accurate to say that militarization is favored or is disfavored in the index because it is measuring either a threat of violence or the, the threat of, a fear of, a fear of violence. And military scores are banded, and this is not a very technical term, but essentially they're diluted to some extent so that it's not that we're taking the, the raw numbers, but rather we're looking at countries' levels of militarization as a proportion of GDP, taking into some consideration countries around them. So we're, we're penalizing countries that have much higher levels of um, militarization as a percentage of GDP as compared to other countries. Um, I think on the, on the question about Egypt, it's just related data, but there was a UND, UNDP report that they interviewed a lot of people who had been recruited into terrorism in Africa. And I think it was like 70 or 80 percent of them said that they had been recruited to a terrorist organization basically because some family or friend had been abused by security forces. So I think this ties back yeah. to what you said earlier about security assistance, right? That counterterrorism done poorly in a heavy-handed way makes the problem worse. Yeah. And I think there's increasing evidence on that front. Looks like we have a question or a comment from the front, and then one more here, and then we're going to probably be out of time. It was actually just a, a small addition to that uh, with regards to a degree of militarization. There are certain components, for example, contributions to UN peacekeeping, that are actually valued positively as mm -hmm. part of the GPI. So, so it's not always cut and dry. Of course, so there, are, there are certain sort of caveats to the knowledge, to the knowledge that we have available. You know, there are certain portions of military expenditure that are classified, for example. So that are, that, you know, there are certain limitations with, with regards to that. Um, also, with regards to your, your second question and about sort of the, the use or the recommendations with regards to more or less security services and the impact that they may have, yes, completely. Um, and that's why, you know, with regards to the positive peace uh, index and framework overall, we very much judge it to be a self-determined process. That the action to be taken in any particular country very much needs to come from within, and that the positive peace framework is purely just the tool to be able to better take that decision. Overall, what we find is that small changes in all of the different uh, pillars, uh, simultaneously or progressively, and, and small nudges offer by far the best, the best results. And any kind of sort of major uh, investments or interventions in any particular um, uh, pillar can obviously lead to unforeseen circumstances, especially with regards to direct security. There's one more question here. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, my name is Joanna Radigan. I'm with Friends of the Global Fight Against AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. Um, thank you all for being here today. This was a really interesting discussion. My question is, given, um, given everything you've discussed today about the closing of civic space and the inclusion of climate change and peace, the decline of peacefulness in some regions and improvements in others, I wanted to ask if you see reasons for optimism for positive or negative peace going forward. Anyone want to take that one? I'm always optimistic, and uh, I'm going to link this back to something that um, was said earlier, that if, and back to your question, sir, about what to say to Congress, I'll just say what I say to them all the time, is that the U.S. government needs more contingency funding and less earmarks on funding so that when a problem arises, we can be very optimistic by hitting the target as, as soon as we possibly can, working with civil society. So although spaces are closing, I, I do remain op optimistic that if we have more contingency funding in the U.S. government, we'll be able to help. So I'm optimistic as well, um, in the sense that I think that civil society is a genie that can't be put back in the bottle. 
Um, and I think that was one of the key lessons from the Arab Spring. Um, even when things started to sour and governments started to you know, close ranks um, and close space around civil society again, we, I was at USAID at the time, we interviewed dozens, hundreds of civil society activists who said, I will not go back into that box. Like, there has been a civic spirit that has been awakened and we're not gonna go back. Mm -hmm. So that gives me a lot of encouragement. And then the work that I now do with civic, I mean, we are in the sort of deep field, we call it, engaging directly with civilians. And, you know, and civilians and citizens are going to do what it takes to have their needs met, um, and they're not easily silenced. And so that's what gives me encouragement or optimism. Um, and so, yeah, there are a lot of challenges, but at the same time, I think that like once you've sort of awakened civil society and that they see that they can make a difference, they're not going to easily be pushed back down. So. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And the one thing, and, and so I'm also in the optimism camp. The one thing I would add is I'm a big believer in transparency and the power of transparency. And the greater the focus and discussion on these issues, uh, the more there will be positive change uh, o over the long term. I'm also optimistic. I thought Shannon's response was particularly eloquent. And I would also add, I think we, we can see, we can look to young people. We see tremendous youth movements in the US, for instance, against gun violence around the world, um, advocating for better climate change um, regulations. So I think that that's where I would place my optimism. Well, thank you so much to the panel and to Lori. Um, and thanks for all of you for being here today. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you, guys.